Greetings. We have something very special for you this week. Normally, my YouTube channel is reserved for my presentations on various subjects. Matthew, my son, has also presented some material on it. And this week we're doing something different. I had the opportunity to participate in a camp meeting on the East Coast uh, in 2005. And at that particular meeting, there was a round table discussion by three individuals that you need to hear. During the 1950 to 1980 period, massive changes were taking place in our understanding of righteousness by faith and various related topics that are affecting us to this very day. There were three individuals who uh, lived through that period and understood what was going on at that time. And they got together for a round table. Colin Standish, Russell Standish, and Ron Spear. They are no longer with us, but now we have a chance to hear them one more time. Because they understood what was happening during that time, and during this roundtable, they shared their reflections on what, it, what really happened and what impact it has for us today. So that's why I decided that this time you would be hearing from them and you would understand from their perspective what it was like during those critical years of changes in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, unfortunately, this is available only in audio form, not video form. And so I'm going to encourage you to listen carefully. There are several parts to this presentation, and we will present them all. And so enjoy the nice pictures, but the, uh, the presentations will all be in audio form. So enjoy and reflect. Colin, I think you have something in mind for us to begin this discussion. On I this. certainly do. Um, I'm going to take us, we're fast forwarding we, to try to get uh, more material out, and um, I'm taking up what took place 1973 through 1975. That has been, to this point, the last opportunity that God's people have had to come to revival and reformation in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was the second attempt of God in this church. 1888 was the first major effort to redirect God's people towards the reformation and revival that God is anxious to have. And you remember on that occasion, the people turned away, the leaders, many of the leaders turned away from that precious message of Christ our righteousness claiming it to be antinomianism, that is, um, not sufficiently on the law. Listen, brethren and sisters, we are not legalists. We're not antinomian. We put together the law and the gospel, binding it up together. That is how God has it in his word. And uh, that's how it came again in 1973. I had just come to be the chairman of the psychology department of Columbia Union College. And uh, I'd been here a month to serve in the United States. I was thrilled to know that for the first time in my life, I would have the privilege of attending at least a good number of the sessions of the annual council of that year, because Columbia Union College was just a mile away at that time from where the general conference was. And every spare moment when I wasn't teaching, I was up there listening to it, I don't know that I can uh, describe the electric feeling that I had to hear Elder Pearson bringing forth this great call for revival and reformation in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. It really inspired me to the, the, the heights that I had never experienced before in my life. And I thought perhaps there is to be a great revival in the Church of God. That was uh, October 
early October of 1973. These words, of course, had great significance at that time. I'm reading from Psalms 85, verses 4 through 6. Listen to it carefully. How we need this fulfilled today. But whether God is willing to fulfill it in the terrible state of our church today, I do not know. But he is going to do it for his faithful people. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger towards us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that the people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I pray for that today, that God in his great mercy will somehow still bring to us that revival that is absolutely essential to the finishing of God's work, and that is starting with each one of us, all the eyes that are here this morning in this uh, convocation, this camp meeting. Message after message was given on the message of Christ our righteousness. But I could quickly sense that not all the delegates there were really inspired by it. Or there were some that were. The visitors, and there weren't too many outside the delegates there in the Tacoma Park Church where so often the annual council used to be held. But nevertheless, that inspiration came through. I knew we had a godly general conference present, a man that God was using. In 1974, I was then president of Columbia Union College and therefore an automatic delegate and voting member of the annual council. This, that year, it was held at Loma Linda University Church in California. And I took very seriously the responsibility there. On numbers of occasions, I went to the microphone to express my heartfelt concern for what was taking place in our church. And uh, Elder Pearson again brought this message of revival. He chose men of God to give the morning devotional dedicated to that emphasis. I'll never forget the presentation taken by Elder Frazee the head of Wildwood, a man of God, if ever there was a man of God. And Elder Frisi gave a marvelous presentation um, on that morning when he had been chosen. I was absolutely flabbergasted when shortly afterward my union president came to me, what's Pearson doing bringing that rebel here to speak to us? I said, Elder, that was a wonderful, it just got to my heart this morning. Well, he's a rebel. Now, I got on very well with my union president. I uh, appreciate him very highly, but I tell you, I was just taken aback that there were people that would have that feeling about a man that was so dedicated to God and gave so many wonderful messages on the principles of salvation, as Elder Frazee did. And if you haven't heard his tapes, they are classical tapes on true salvation. Um, well, when I realized I was uh, voted to be a delegate at the 1975 General Conference session in Vienna, Austria, the first time it was ever held outside the United States of America, oh, what a thrill. I said, this is where Elder Pearson will be able to take this message worldwide. I had already apparently attracted his attention because after the 1974 General Conference session, he called me up to his office, annual council, I'm sorry. Um, he called me up to his office and he said, Colin, I want to talk to you. I took notice of what you were saying at the, uh, the, uh, uh, spring, uh, the fall convocation. And um, Elder Pearson said, look, if you can continue that, Columbia Union College is in good hands. That's what he said to me. I was shocked. I didn't realize he'd taken any notice. But that started a friendship 
that never stopped until he passed away in January of 1989. In other words, a 15-year period of time. Well, with great anticipation, I flew with the Columbia Union delegation in a chartered flight in which many of the General Conference leaders were on as well, an old Boeing 707 in those days, Pan Am, by the way, that doesn't exist anymore. But we flew to Vienna, direct to Vienna. I said, my, if this plane goes down, so many of the leaders of this church are going to go down with it. It didn't go down, God's blessing was on it. But very quickly into that session, I knew the revival and reformation wouldn't come. It was a tragic session. And the Europeans largely were to blame for it. I got sick of talking to European delegates, especially German delegates. We're not a, an American church. I said, listen, I'm not an American either. Sister White may have been an American citizen. That's got nothing to do with the issue of the spirit of prophecy. The fact is God chose her to be his agent to present to us the wonderful messages that will help us on the way to the kingdom of heaven. But I may as well have talked to a, to a deaf man that couldn't hear a word. They were determined. Unfortunately, or at least um, as it turned out, unfortunately, um, the first edition of Ellen White in Europe was put out. Elder Delafield, D.A. Delafield, had written carefully a wonderful book on Sister White's two years in Europe, hoping that that would be a blessing and help with them to understand and to believe more fully in the spirit of prophecy. But the artist who put the cover together had put these rings around the body of Sister White, um, going from uh, yellow up to green around her. And the Europeans said, this is idolatry. Uh, they're putting halos around Sister White. Now, of course, that wasn't the intention, but that's how it was. Satan finds a way to put a loophole in it. And so the book may as well not have been written because the Europeans were so critical of the cover of the book. I'm sure most of them didn't open beyond the cover. Later, my brother and I, and uh, with Pastor Burnside, who was over, we were speaking in North Carolina at the Hendersonville Church in North Carolina in 1986. 85, 85 was it? All right, 1985. That was 10 years after it. He knows because he had to come from Australia for it. And in, in that uh, time, Elder Pearson, of course, never once did not turn up to any meetings that I ran down in North Carolina. I ran quite a few in various churches there, including the Arden Church, Hendersonville, and the like. And um, he invited us home for lunch. And so he was asked, um, what happened in 1975? We were curious to see what Elder Pearson thought. He had a simple statement, neither the clergy nor the laity were ready for that revival and reformation. What a tragedy. I hope the laity and the clergy that are sitting here this morning are ready for revival and reformation in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you're not, pray to God to give you that spirit of revival and reformation. I asked him a second time on another occasion, and Elder Pearson came... To and he said, Colin, yes, it'll take a long time. I'll ha you'll have to wait. But there was never another time because he was dead not long after that. But never once when I was down there preaching in North Carolina did he not invite me home to his place for lunch or alternatively we would go together to a salad bar for lunch so we could dialogue together. Never did he come up to Washington Without, I would get a telephone call from Elder Pearson saying, Colin, I'm coming up to, to Washington for a week or whatever length of time it was. 
Is it possible for you to put aside a day with me so we can dialogue together? I tell you, they were precious times. Of course I always found a day. Usually he came up twice a year, and he'd spend a, day to t a week to ten days on each of those occasions. I tell you, I learned so much from Elder Pearson. But you see, he was so burdened. His first burden was for the South Pacific Division. He saw what was taking place. In 1974, the Adventist Review had put out its magnificent special edition on righteousness by faith. Anyone still got a copy of that? A few people, I see a hand here and there. If ever a, a copy of the review should be re, reprinted, it's that issue Amen. of righteousness by faith. It was only a few weeks after that I got a frantic call, a call from Elder Wood and uh, Elder Kenneth Wood, the editor of the, ed, ed, the, well, what was called the Review and Herald then. Colin, can you come up and spare a couple of hours with us? We just can't make fathom of what's happening in Australia. Of course, I went up there. With him was Dr. Herb Herbert Douglas, who was then an associate editor of the Review. I took up jo Dr. Blanco, my... Uh, academic dean, the four of us sat together for two hours dialoguing on what was happening in Australia. He said, I think I know every stamp that is produced in Australia. He said, I'm just getting barrages with angry letters over that righteousness by faith issue. And he said, almost all of them are coming from the South Pacific. And he said, almost all of them are coming from ministers and conference presidents. That was back in 1974, 32 years ago. That was happening down in the South Pacific. No wonder it's in such chaos today. Well, we went through it. What could he do? How could he handle it? Well, of course, I said, you've just got to, you cannot back away from this message, Ken, I said to him. You've got to continue to get those articles out. Don't take notice of the um, Australasian Division, as it was then called. Don't take notice of it. Put out the message. And he decided to do that. It was to end in him having, well, being almost forced into resignation six years later. But he did it. He was a man of God. He pushed forward. And uh, it went in that, di that direction. Also, that was the first time, now you wouldn't believe it, you might be shocked at what I'm going to say. The first time I really gave thought to the centrality of the human nature of Christ. Of course I'd grown up in Australia. All I ever heard was that Christ took upon himself our fallen nature. No minister in those days would have ever preached anything different from that. And um, if you look at Dr. Larson's book, The Word Made Flesh, and if you don't have that, that's a classic of all classics on the human nature of Christ. Uh, every Seventh-day Adventist worthy salt should have that book. But that book, um, he gives... All, and many of the Australians are quoted in there of our generation, the old people like Pastor Salton and so on, that we revered as boys that were old ministers in our day. And um, all of them said that Christ took our fallen nature because that's what the Bible says. That's what the spirit of prophecy says over and over again. And um, so uh, there were these efforts to put forward that. But during that dialogue, Elder Wood said, said to us, you know, the real basic issue on righteousness by faith is the human nature of Christ, that he took our fallen nature. Now, I agreed with him that Christ took our fallen nature because that was what I grew up. I'd never studied it. You know, when everyone's in unison, you tend not to study. So, as we were driving back, Jack Blanco, Dr. Blanco and myself, the one mile from the GC, I turned to to Jack and I said, look, Jack, um, everything Ken said and, and Herb said today, I agreed with, 
but I'm not so sure that the centrality of righteousness by faith is bound up in the human nature of Christ. But I said, come to think of it, I've never studied it. I got the shock of my life. Dr. Blanco turned to me and said, well, neither have I. I said, Jack, you've got four theological degrees and you've never studied who Jesus was. He had a BA in theology, he had a BTH in theology, he had a um, M, M div, and he had a doctor in theology. Four degrees in theology, and he'd never studied who Jesus was, at least in his human nature. I said, listen, Jack, I'm making a commitment that every moment I get now, I'm going to study it out for myself. That's the way we must be on these things. And uh, Dr. Blanco said to me, I'm going to join you. Well, it didn't take me all of five weeks, but in my spare time for five weeks, I was going through the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, and so on. Eventually, I was convinced that what Elder Wood had said was absolutely the truth. How can you have the message of Christ, our righteousness, if you don't even know who Jesus is? Or if you've got a false view of who Jesus is, how could he be my example as well as my substitute if he was not tempted in all points like as I, we are yet without sin? How could he not be? And if he had a different nature from me, how could he ever be that kind of an example? Be our, he's our, our example in all things who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Oh, what a revelation. I remember the day. It was a Friday lunchtime. I'd finished more or less for the morning. Dr. Blanco's office was next to mine, but I'd had a door put in between the offices so we didn't have to walk out in the corridors around. We could just go from one office to the other. And this um, Friday, I said to, to him, I got, went in and I said, Jack, I've been studying through, as I said I would, the human nature of Christ. I want to tell you what I've discovered, that Ken Wood is absolutely correct. The bottom line is who Jesus was as our Savior. I'll never forget Dr. Blanco looking at me with that twinkle in his eye, if any of you know him. And he said, Colin, I've been studying it too, and I've come to the same conclusion. I tell you, that was another electric moment in my life to know my academic dean had come to the same conviction on the human nature of Christ. We got down in his office, and there we thanked God and rejoiced together. The Lord had led us to such a wonderful truth. Brethren and sisters, we have to search. That's why heresies come into the church. And don't sit back and say, I don't believe it. You better find out why you don't believe it. Well, I'm going to leave it there for the moment. That, of course, is not the, the end of that story, but I'm going to leave it there for this moment.